live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE, covering VMworld 2017. Brought to you by VMware and its ecosystem partners. I'm Stu Miniman, here with my co-host John Troyer, and you're watching theCUBE, SiliconANGLE Media's production of VMworld 2017. We're the worldwide leader in live tech coverage. Happy to welcome to the program, not only a first time guest, but a first time for the company, uh, Andrew Hilliard, uh, who is the CTO and co-founder of Densify, uh, and not only first time we've had Densify, we didn't even have Serba on, so I, I'm, I'm not sure uh, what the problem was, but uh, appreciate you joining us, and uh, looking forward to uh, learning about you in, in the company. Yeah, glad to be here, it's good. All right, Andrew, tell us a little bit about, you know, you, you're a co-founder, so, you know, bring us back to the early days, what the idea was, and then uh, there was some rebranding recently, so I, I know that's, uh, you know, relevant to the conversation. Sure, I'll, I'll tell you the story. So, we're all about analytics. I, I mean, we, we started off by looking at you know, the, all the data that's available and saying if you really do the math on it, you can make a lot of very important decisions and not leave them to opinions or chance. Um, so we built out a very powerful analytics engine. A lot of big customers adopted it, um, run on-prem, drive huge savings in virtual environments, de-risk. Um, and what we found was that everybody's really interested in those outcomes um, of the analytics, but not necessarily um, wanting to adopt software products. I mean, it's kind of the basis of all SaaS. So we, so we went and, and made a, a SaaS version of that product um, that runs, it's like a brain in the cloud, to give the same outcomes, and we've kind of really now taken that to the extreme where it's as a service now, and it's called Densify. So we rebranded around that uh, in the June time frame to really capture the simplicity and the outcome of what we do, which is to drive down cloud cost, drive down the amount of infrastructure you need on-prem, and, and make it all work better. Yeah, I'm wondering if you can give us just a little, from a macro standpoint, software and the different consumption models. You, you, you just walked through it a little bit, but you know, what are customers looking for? Why has it been challenging before? And you know, do we have it right this time? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, from our perspective, again, I think we, we, we get adopted and, and traditionally in the past you would uh, you'd have to deploy the, the product, so you'd have to provision servers to run it on, a database server, train people, um, you know, have maybe a center of excellence around using it. And so, and that's worked really well, but I think that's, you know, that's, I think, the novelty of running software has worn off for most organizations. I think they want to move on. As, as we see the cloud being adopted, people just want to get out of the business of running anything, really, and, and, and have it all done for them. So, um, we, you know, we support the on-prem model and, and as a managed service on-prem, but really, this new model is, is, is where everybody's going because it's just so simple. It, it means you can just adopt it and get results right away without reading any manuals or, or doing anything. Andrew, we've been talking about cloud for years now, right? It, 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 it's, it, it was almost a joke, it's, it's much more real now. Uh, your customers and the people you talk with, hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, how, how many, we have a choice of many different platforms, on-prem on is not going away anytime soon, uh, at least, I don't know, I'd love your, your opinion on that, but your customer base, uh, the people you talk with, what kind of a, how many platforms are they on? What kind of platforms? And how, do, how does Densify pull all that together? Yeah, it's funny because there's a bit of everything, and that's like IT, right? You always have one of everything you ever had, plus all the new stuff. So, um, we of course, see still huge, huge virtual footprints out there. A lot of companies have big VMware environments, um, but there's definitely a big focus on the cloud. So almost every customer we have is in some form looking at it, is really the, they see that as a future. The cloud, containers, some mix of on and off-prem. So I think it's going to be hybrid for quite some time. I don't think you're going to see the on-prem go away. Uh, that would just be unrealistic, but again, a lot of energy is being put into the public cloud, and it, it shows. So, so you know, one's almost a maintain mode in some cases. One's kind of the invest. You know, we're investing in this new technology, and it's where a lot of the excitement is. So, um, even our most conservative customers are looking at cloud in some way, and some of our newer customers are 100% cloud. There's no on-prem. Uh, Andrew, talk to us about the relationship with VMware that, that you've had and have today, and uh, I guess one of the questions I, I looked, VMware announced like seven SaaS services, right. one which was Cost Insight. Does that compete at all against uh, what, what you're doing? Well, it's, 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 a, it's a hugely complicated space with a lot of different, and a lot of the same words used for all the same things. So we have a good relationship with VMware. Um, we integrate with all the, all the product line, VRA, uh, VROPS, DRS, PDRS. We have integration with all these things, and it works with that. But I think there's some confusion sometimes around people using the same words, like we optimize or we do this or that. So what we find is that in the core of what we do is we analyze workload patterns, and it's like playing a game of Tetris. It's like saying that workload's busy in the morning, that one's busy at night. We combine them together, we get a lot of efficiency, and, and nothing in the VMware product line does that. So it really plugs in really nicely with DRS and, and, and again, VROPS, um, but there is confusion in the words people use, and people might think that does that. You know, and there's some cost, you know, there's a lot of products that do cloud cost. Every, every, every product that starts with the word cloud does cloud cost. 
Um, but that's not really where you get this cost saving, it's really analyzing the workloads in the cloud is where you get the real cost savings. Yeah, I, I'm curious, you must have, have, have a really good view as to utilization. So, you know, I, I think back, uh, you know, there's lots of arguments as to how much utilization are we actually getting? Because VMware, in the early days, it was like, oh, I'll consolidate servers, I'll get greater utilization. But we still kind of stink at utilization. Yeah, yeah. When I have gear, even cloud today, we, I've seen lots of companies, right, that are, I can take huge amount of costs out of what you're doing. So, how are customers doing? What are they good at? What do they suck at? And you know, wh wh where are some of the you know, things that you're helping really well? Well, you, I mean, you, you, know? you, you struck a nerve there because the, people are doing a terrible job in the cloud quite often. <laughs> it's, it's, um, a lot of times they throw things up there and they don't even really look at what they're doing. It's, it's, it's kind of primitive in terms of the data collection and, the, and the, 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 the tooling around that. So a lot of times you see people that don't even know what the, the workload is or what the utilization is. So we see some pretty big opportunities to carve that down. I mean, on-prem, I think people have gotten better. I, I think when they run our product, they really, it's designed to get at the optimal utilization. And that might be 90%, it might be 50%, it might be 30, depending on your requirements. And if you have a mission critical environment that is you know, active, active, and redundant, and all these things going on, then maybe your utilization won't be very high, but that's as high as you can make it and meet all your obligations. If a dev test environment, you, know, you can run it a lot higher. So w there is no one right answer for what the best utilization is. It's kind of, it depends on your workloads and what, you, what the environment's supposed to be doing. But universally in the cloud we find it's just terrible because uh, they rush things into the cloud without having all the maturity around it to figure out how to optimize it. Right. Andrew, does that mean then the, the common mistake is under utilization? Do people are just running a lot of instances without actually knowing what's running in them or, or yeah, how much yeah. it's costing them? There's, there's under utilization, there's deadwood for starters. So there's, and that's kind of a different problem. It's not that they don't know what they're doing, it's that somebody forgot them. So there's no process around that. There's no ITSM you know, process to turn these things off. So we find a lot of that. Then there's the stuff that's not utilized very well at all that you could just be running better because somebody said I need an extra large and never revisit it. The other fascinating one that we do, and we, we find this quite a lot lately, is, is what we call modernization. So you're, you look okay, but you're on an old instance. There's a newer one that's a lot cheaper. Mm. You know, you're on an R3, you could be on an R4 in Amazon. So we find a ton of those, and it's because people deploy an app six months ago, a year ago, and it, it's looked great, it still looks great, but they don't have the ability to analyze that and, and, and use benchmarks to say, I have a new instance that's as powerful as that one, that's cheaper. And you need, you need the benchmark to do that's that. That's something that really doesn't happen when you have hardware, right? It, it's not like uh, the server vendor calls you up and says, uh, I have a new version I can swap out uh, if you just tell me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it, well, in, in the cloud, I, I give the analogy to a, a, a cell phone company. It's like, they don't phone you and tell you they have a new plan that would be cheaper for you. You've got to kind of do that on your own. And so we do that for our customers. It's one of the things that we do, and we, we kind of do it for you. So we just tell you that, you can just make this move, this kind of lateral move to a new instance and save a ton of money. And your know, customers, they're just, they're too busy to become experts and, and, and read the news every morning to figure out if new instances come up. <laughs> it's just too much, right? Wait, wait, they haven't seen these 17 announcements that Amazon had today <laughs> yeah. that might have affected them. Um, does your tool make the change, recommend the change? How, how does that kind of workflow work? Yeah, it, it, I mean, it depends on the platform how it works, but we have a, a very high degree of automation that we enable, and, and there's a few reasons. One is that the, the analysis is so precise that when it says you do this, you can just do that. So for example, on-prem, if we say move a VM, we know it's not supposed to go with those other ones for PCI compliance. We know that that won't drive up the overcommit. So there's a, a, you know, our equation has a lot of terms. It means it's very precise. So when we say to do something, you can just do it. And that means you can drive very high automation mm -hmm. as a result. What, what kind of granularity? Is this happening minute by minute, or hour by hour, or day by day? Well, there's, there's two levels of granularity. There's, there's, there's predictive and there's real time. So one of the main things we do is that we will kind of gather all the workload history and kind of learn the patterns of that and to come up with a strategic plan saying, for tomorrow, do this. Put the VMs in these places and then you know, leave DRS turned on. It'll do its thing, but it won't do very much because we've anticipated all the workload patterns. So a lot of times we'll do the kind of, the, the, the kind of daily optimization and then DRS and VROPS can do their things all day long. They just don't do as much. Mm -hmm. um, but we do also have real time. So if we see something getting hot, we will do a hot add on it. Or you know, we can do that as well. So we kind of have the combination of both predictive and reactive at the same time. Okay, um, how do you handle kind of your pricing uh, of the solution? I've, I've heard some offerings out there that it's like, oh, we're going to save you millions and we're just going to take a fraction of that rather than that, or are you, right. you a more traditional licensing? How, how does that all, all, all work? It's funny, the gain, the gain share we found is, is, is very hard to structure. Yeah. I mean, just from a, from a, it sounds great until you try and make the contracts for it. Um, what we do is for on-prem, we do it by, by target and that's a physical or virtual system. That's worked really well. Uh, you know, that's the way a lot of our customers go there. In the cloud, that doesn't work because an instance could be anything from a tiny Docker container to a giant X1. So it's, it's as a percentage of spend. That's kind of what a lot of uh, vendors kind of settle on in the cloud world. 
Um, but we kind of don't make it infinitely variable. We know people want, we, they want the kind of predictability. Um, so we kind of say, you're in this band, it's just going to cost this, and you can do whatever you want. And, you know, and, yeah. you know what, do, do you have any kind of standard rule of thumb as to, you know, if you have X kind of spend in the cloud, we're, we'll usually save you X percentage, or, and, and wait, if you save them a lot more, doesn't that mean you're pushing them down <laughs> into a lower tier? So, uh, you know, how, do, how does that get sorted that's out? That's a great question, yeah. it's, that's the hazard of it, but it is, I mean, it doesn't hold us back from wanting to optimize, so what we find is, is um, if you just take, for example, right-sizing the cloud, if you say you're underutilized, we can make you smaller in the same class, a lot of people would say 15% you might save. We find that the ability to go between instance classes, so again, you, you're a memory optimizer, you reckon you'd be a compute optimizer, vice versa, we found it's 35 to 40%, pretty reliably, um, in the customers, in our customers. So it's a pretty, it, it, it more than pays for the product many times over, it's pretty compelling, and it's, it's pretty easy uh, to get to, and it affects next month's bill, which is the biggest thing, you know, on-prem is sunk cost. You can optimize it a lot, but it's it's until the next refresh, you may not realize the gains, but in the cloud, next month's bill will actually be smaller. So we, we find it's a lot of um, urgency to do it in the cloud. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, what, what are you seeing from customers these days between their on-premises environment and the public cloud? One thing that struck me for years is, you know, if I bought gear and I'm not getting the, you know, the results of the utilization out of it, you know, that kind of got a lot of attention. Uh, when I go see the public cloud, there's plenty of customers who are like, oh, what do you know, I was over spending 3X more than I expected, ha ha, I guess I'll fix it later. And I was like, wait, if, if you were buying hardware, you would have you know, fired somebody and like beat up your sales rep and things like that, but you know, public cloud seems to be less mature in that standpoint. Are you, are you seeing, it's seeing that changing, or what, what, are you, what are you seeing from customers? Yeah, I, I think there is yeah. a realization that kind of sticker shock hits people where it is kind of three times more than they thought it would be, but to your point, there's also not really anybody whose problem that is a lot of times. So we do see that becoming someone's problem. Like cloud architects, we see kind of more roles that are financial optimization in the cloud, so people do care. So I think that's a, a very, you know, positive thing. I think when a lot of DevOps groups start using Amazon for the first time, it's a bit of a wild west, and they get agility, but nobody's really looking over the shoulder. I think that's starting to change pretty quickly. Yeah, I, I, I wonder, one of the problems I've heard, I've talked to plenty of customers that are like, I have to dedicate an engineer to pricing yes. when it comes yeah. to the cloud. Do you solve that? Do they still need to kind of have like, you know, a dedicated person or part of a person, or is that, is that part of the value that you offer? Well, and that, that's a good question. It depends on the customer size, I think. Yeah. So we see really small organizations, and again, the, the beauty of our, of our new offering is that you, you, we, we can, you, know, you can go to really small companies or really huge companies. We have customers with 100,000 systems and some with 500. Um, and the smaller ones, they may not have a big team, so they may not have those roles. So some of our smallest ones, we're just that role for them. We, they don't have a, a person that's dedicated to that kind of thing. They just wait for our advisors to chime in because we actually have a human advisor that's part of our service that, that gives you advice or insight into what's happening. So for the small ones, that can be that person. For larger uh, companies like the big banks that are customers of ours, we kind of become one of the team. So you probably still have people with a lot of these expertise, but maybe you don't need to rely on it so much. Maybe you can not have it at all, uh, but it's more like we're someone that makes their life easier. So they can go on and focus on what they should be doing, which is not looking at the cloud pricing every morning. Nice, I, I see that more and more, right? You need, the, it's a service you're delivering, right? And that's not just bits and bytes, that's customer success, and, and you have people there that can help. Yeah. Uh, this stuff is, is crazy complicated, especially if you're, say, a VMware admin just getting into Amazon, uh, the pricing, like we just said, right? The pricing yeah. is, is very complicated. So, um, can you talk a little bit about, the, from the admin standpoint, the, the vRealize uh, integration and some things like that, or is this, uh, there's an admin facing piece, and I suppose then there's the, also the cost facing piece. Yeah, I think there's, there's several ways we can be used. You, you can use us almost like middleware, and, and the admin doesn't necessarily even need to interact. We, 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 the summer cost we run as an engine that's just sit there, it's getting data, analyzing, and then making changes. Um, but you know, you're still using VRA for blueprints and VRO, and that kind of comes through us, but it's kind of behind the scenes. So it's a nice use case because it just adds value without making anybody's life more difficult. We do have consoles that are very powerful, so if you're a capacity manager or a data scientist or a cloud architect, you can start logging in and actually seeing workload curves and stuff. So we have some use cases where we are, you know, our interface is used quite heavily and some where it kind of sits in the behind the scenes. Um, you know, and so for administrators, again, it, it tends to make your life better without making it worse. Again, they're, they're really busy as well and they don't, you know, well, as they have time to look at that. So. If you have a big investment to be realized, right? That's, a, that's great, it yeah. just sits behind the scenes. Tools you already know. Yeah, exactly. We just pull data from it and we push our else back. We pull rules from DRS, we push new rules down the DRS. Nice. It's all very clean and so it just it makes it all better yeah. um, without overlapping. And again, it makes the environment calmer. So what we see in a lot of environments is you'll be able to fit a lot more work into it and you don't have vMotion activity during business hours. 
So we're starting to measure that in our customers because volatility is an important thing. Like if you motion at noon at the peak of your app being busy, it, it's not good, right? So, so we actually cause that to go away. Yeah, and, and how much of your business is on, uh, on premises and virtualized environment and versus cloud and any kind of you know, lineup as to where you spend the most time in the cloud? Well, yeah. I, I think for, I mean, we have a, a lot of customers that are mostly VMware. I think a, a good portion of them are looking at cloud in some way. Um, some of our newer customers are 100% in the cloud, so that's, but that's kind of more, because this is a newer offering and Densify is quite new, I think that's a smaller number right now, but as far as what we're chasing down, it's, it's, it's a big, it's a, it's a very large portion of it. So I think it's, it's really where we see where things are going. Um, it, again, it's, it's, we usually do both, but the cloud stuff has really got captured their imagination. That's what they want to be doing. Yeah. A any commentary on the VMware on AWS? Uh, you know, stuff that we've heard so far. Well, I, I mean, I think it's cool. It's, it's great. It, it's, uh, it's another option. What I like about it is that what we find is when we analyze, um, there's technologies that overcommit and ones that don't. So I can take a workload and put it in a VMware environment and overcommit it, and let the patterns match up and get efficiency. If I put that in Amazon, in like a by a large instance, I might be wasting my money because I'm not using the whole instance. So, and I can't run a hypervisor in one of those. Hmm. But what we found is that um, for certain transactional applications, it's much better to stack them together. For like batch workloads, it's better to run them in a, you know, rent a, a large for an hour. So I think it's a great offering because for certain workloads, it is quite efficient. For other workloads, it's not. And, and we, we, we have, you know, it, we we're showing here today, the ability to analyze and compare the two. Saying if you took that app and put it in the new VMware on Amazon versus standard small, medium, and large, what's the cost difference? It's, it's, a, it's a cool analysis because it's different for each app, right? Yeah. Uh, if I saw right, is there a free trial available on your site? Is there anybody that ever comes up, tries your stuff, and doesn't have something that saves them money? No, <laughs> it's, we have a very good success when you try, when you try it, because it, it, uh, it, partly because it's so easy. I mean, it's just, it's 15 minutes, you, you, you pull down a connector for VMware, and you plug it into vCenter or vROPS, and the data goes up, and then we just do it all for you, and it'll always find it's something you didn't know, or some savings, or some hidden risks in there. Uh, usually, a lot of savings, hardware savings, or, or software savings. We will optimize the software licensing, um, and in the cloud, it, it uncovers all kinds of stuff. We see all kinds of crazy stuff. It, low, utilization very low, so it's it's a yeah. I, I I I've run across people that do this similar sorts of things, at least at a high level. On, on the virtualized side and on the cloud side, I'm not sure that I've seen anybody that, that does it at, at both. Is that one of your differentiations? How do you how do you line up? What's the competitive landscape look yeah, like? Yeah, it, doing both is a big part. I yeah. think on each of them individually, we also do it much deeper. So like I said, in the virtual environments, the, our ability to play Tetris with the workloads is nothing else really really like it. It's, it's we put a lot of R and D uh, on that. And in the cloud, there's a lot of there's a lot of focus on the cost, but not necessarily digging deeper into what's the cause of that cost or your your Kubernetes environment, you know, the, the utilization of those nodes, it, it, so it requires deeper analytics than a lot of vendors actually have, so, yeah. yeah. Um, do you give any advice as to them saying, I'm trying to decide if I want to do it on premises or in the cloud, do you give a, a, any guidance that way? I don't think there's any standard answer. We, don't, we try to take sides, like the, the data talks, yeah. and it's not, a, in my opinion, it's, it's, it's not an area for opinion, it's just the numbers will tell you what's best for your apps yeah, and everybody's different. You, you're talking, sir, you know, I've got this batch application, oh, well, heck, I can run this in, you know, some extra large thing in the cloud, and, you know, therefore it would cost me this versus, you know, standing up some server farm. Yeah, yeah. It, what, what we find is that the, 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 you know, the only real trick is that, like, absolutely, if you have something that's live for 12 hours and then off for a week, Renting an instance for 12 hours is, is, is the way to go. But the other consideration, it goes back to one of your earlier questions, is, is multi-cloud. And how many different providers do you want? Because we'll analyze the environment and that app might be cheaper in Azure and that one might be cheaper in Google. Mm -hmm. and, but you're not going to put each app in each, so you're going to choose one or two and kind of send them all there. So the analytics understand that as well. They're saying, well, you're not going to spread stuff everywhere. We're going to find the best overall answer for your portfolio of workloads. That, that's, and that's an important thing. Okay, so last question for you. The virtualization admins out there, is there anything that they're still doing kind of very wrong that, you know, they, that, that would make their uh, environment more efficient? Well, I think, it, I mean, it's funny that we still see an awful lot of spreadsheets out there. I, it, it's, it's, it's funny when people try and do the numbers, like to figure out where to put a new app. Um, and they'll, they'll still kind of figure that out in a very rudimentary way, when, again, science will tell you that. So um, you can make that happen automatically. So there's still certain things I think people are doing manually that don't need to be done manually anymore. And maybe it's, it's their, their comfort zone uh, you know, maybe it's admins, maybe it's other groups, but I think, um, <laughs> you know, again, our, one of our, our focus is saying that's that's great. Let's let's take your policies and your rules. We'll just embed them, encode them, codify them, and then you can move on to better things than than updating a spreadsheet or generating reports to send to your team every week. You know, like it's we have very powerful reporting, so you can just make that happen and automatically to people. And so 
is getting out of those kind of tasks that people have done for years and, and moving up the value chain and saying, now I'm going to focus on, on cloud or on vSAN or whatever it is people want to be doing next. All right, Andrew Hillier, appreciate you giving us uh, all the updates on your company and uh, look forward to hearing more in the future. John Troyer and I will be back with lots more coverage here from VMworld 2017. You're watching theCUBE. <laughs>